time to get going. So excited about this, excited where we're, what we're doing tonight. I'm looking forward to tonight, I really am. Um, looks like you didn't invite all your friends to come with you. <laughs> A couple of you have all your friends with you, and, you know, some of you, you know. Uh, but yeah, we'll see what we do here. I'm, I'm excited about it, looking forward to it. Um, hope you're having a good week. Some announcements just to go over with you. Um, Sunday we'll be having our regular services, uh, 10.30 morning worship and then 6 o'clock evening worship. Uh, children's churches are going well. I was talking with Daniel today. And since we have started in September, started uh, the on Sunday mornings, the children's churches, Tyler Church, children's church, jam time. Uh, Wednesday night, we started a WANA program back up. And since we have started those things, um, I've seen, we've seen the attendance, uh, church attendance kind of go upwards. There's an upward trend in, in that. With the Sunday morning, there's about 15 or 20 people more than what we were having before. Wednesday nights, there's about 10 or 15 people more than what we were having before. And so there is a trend right now with things kind of trying to open up just a little bit, going a little bit, uh, that we are moving in a positive direction. So that's good to see, but we will be having those things Sunday. But then this Sunday morning also, we'll be celebrating communion in the, in the morning worship. Um, looking forward to that. Uh, just kind of give you a little bit of direction here tonight for those of you that are here um, so you kind of know what's happening. As you come in the two doors over here by the Welcome Center, um, there will be a deacon on each side as you come into the doors, and they will have these uh, communion. Uh, it's a communion to-go things that we have that we've ordered online, and we've got these things that have come in. And so you'll be able to get those, take those with you to your seats. Don't open them yet, um, but we will have those and hold on to those. And then when it's time for us at the end of the service, we're going to uh, do communion together. And so that's when I have you open them up and, and go through that. But, um, but it will be something a little different. I, I was looking, because it is a Sunday morning, I, I wanted to, to speak on something different, not just a normal, and I, I, don't, I don't mean to say it like that, but not, not your typical communion service. I wanted it to be a little bit different and go in a different direction. Uh, and so it's going to be a little bit different Sunday morning. I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I've already got it written and done and ready to go. And I, I, I spent yesterday and today just taking care of Sunday. So I'm ready. I'm good. I'm excited about it. It may change between now and Sunday because that's usually what happens. But I do have, uh, have it ready to go. So I'm excited about that. Um, next Wednesday night, we'll be having the same things going on here, midweek Bible studies and everything happening. Um, we still are doing masks. And what we're doing right now is we're still asking people, if you're sick, if you're not feeling well, if you've been exposed possibly to anyone who may have had the virus or something, you know, we're asking them to stay home. Uh, that's, a tough, that's a tough thing for me to ask, but that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, and we're just kind of trying to keep as healthy here as we can. And so we'll uh, continue to move forward with that. You know, our offerings we're still collecting in the box out in the Welcome Center Tuesday mornings, our, men's, uh, our men are still meeting for a fellowship and sun, on Tuesday mornings. Uh, well, I was going to say back in the choir room. That's where we met this week because of the floors being redone over in the gym. But we'll be back over in the gym next week. So uh, you can meet us over there. This Friday, we'll be having our monthly spaghetti lunch. So we're looking forward to being able to do that. We have about 84 people on our list to be able to serve. Uh, included in that is our police department our fire department, our sheriff's office, uh, and then there's some uh, other people, individual people that we're going to be uh, serving as well. So we have around 80-something people that we'll be uh, serving a spaghetti lunch to on Friday. Um, and then October the 25th through 28th, we'll be having a revival with Joe Tobert. So we're looking forward to having him here. Excited about that. I know you'll uh, get a blessing and you'll be excited about those things that happen. Um, Let's sing. Let's all stand for a minute. We're going to sing the first, the third, and the fourth. So let's all stand. We're going to sing, Blessed Be the Name of the Lord. So you guys sing loud with me. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, be the name of the Lord, the glories of my God and King. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the name, blessed 
Blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. He breaks the power of canceled sin. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His blood can make the foul. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I never shall forget that day. Blessed be the name of the Lord, when Jesus washed my sins away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. All right, thank you very much. You may be seated. I tell you what, I am not a music leader, director. Um, you, I don't do this because I, I, will, I will lose myself. Um, I don't know if you, I, I've been to several concerts over the years. I've been to a lot of Christian concerts, uh, uh, winter jam, things that they do, all these things. And you see people out there, Melinda can do it, Abby can do it, Sydney can do it, but they will clap with the beat and they will sing. Me, I either clap or I sing because I can't clap and sing at the same time. I just can't, I don't have that kind of a rhythm and uh, so any little hiccup messes me up, and, and I, I don't mean to look at Melinda, but I don't know what else to do because I'm worried that I have lost it somewhere. And so, uh, so anyway, I appreciate Melinda dealing with me when I have to lead the music. So we'll see what happens. But uh, anyway, some prayer requests to uh, bring up to you. So we still have a lot of unspoken prayer requests. Uh, to remember, we also have a lot of uh, lost family members who are not Christians, uh, loved ones that we know, uh, so remember them in your prayers. Pray for those who are sick with this virus, uh, and then we have several that are just sick. Um, again, we're going through a time when it's hard to tell the difference, and so just remember those uh, in your prayer uh, for them as well. Pray for our students and, and, and uh, teachers as they are trying to get back to this schooling. I did read correctly maybe today that they are going October sometime 15th I think they're going to be starting back the schools uh, with this uh, plan B or something like that whatever that's called uh, so that's uh, so that will be coming up so look you know pray for our teachers especially when they start going back to school but remember them also remember uh, Mr. Guy Clark um, he called over here today I talked to him for a while uh, he's just he's, he's 92 years old um, his driver's license uh, has been kind of taken away from him right now, um, so he's not able to drive and get out and do a whole lot of things anymore, and he just gets a little lonely. So if you get a chance and you can uh, give him a call, uh, send him something, you know, if you're brave enough and want to call him and go over there and maybe sit with him, uh, if he'll allow you to, I don't even know if he'll allow you to yet, but I, he would appreciate that a whole lot because uh, he just needs some 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 help and protection around him and just uh, remembering him. So remember uh, Mr. Guy Clark. Also, Heather Shea, uh, she uh, texted me this afternoon and she would have been here, but she has had a bad reaction to some medicine that uh, she was taking and her mouth has swollen up and she uh, can't talk, can't, I mean, it's just pretty bad. She is on some new medicine now that is helping that, but uh, she's just very uncomfortable with that. And so remember Miss Heather uh, in your prayers as well. Also, uh, Miss Betty Dixon called, and she has a friend, Faye Varnell. 
Uh, Ms. Faye Varnell had cancer surgery, uh, very serious cancer surgery. She said that they were in there with the, the doctors for about 12 hours on this surgery uh, that she was going through, and she is now recovering from that. But uh, Miss Betty wanted us to remember her friend uh, Faye Varnell in your prayers. And then last, uh, Mr. Randy Varney uh, wanted us to pray for him. He's having some uh, tests done tomorrow, uh, the doctor, and ask that you uh, pray for him as he goes through these tests as well. So let's pray and ask God to be in our service tonight and uh, just uh, these requests that have been mentioned. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all that you do for us, God. We thank you for loving us. God, we thank you for uh, bringing us to this point so far. Uh, God, it's, it seems like 2020 is the year that will never end, and things keep going on and happening. But God, you have been with us every step of the way, and so Lord, we appreciate you and thank you for what you are doing for us. God, we pray that uh, you will be with these requests that have been mentioned tonight, Lord. Uh, Miss Varnell, uh, who is recovering from this cancer surgery, Lord, we pray that you will be with her, with Mr. Randy, as he... Uh, goes to the doctor tomorrow, Lord. We pray that things will be uh, uh, good for him as he goes there and has some test run. Lord, we also pray for our teachers and, and students that are involved with school, Lord. I pray that you will give them the patience that they need and the, uh, uh, just the ability to be able to uh, uh, make this work. And so, God, we, just, uh, we know that there's others that are sick, not feeling well. And, God, we're just in a tough time right now. So, God, we just lift all of these things to you and ask for your help and ask for your uh, mercies on us. So God, we, we give this all to you tonight, in Jesus' name, amen. Um, it is Wednesday night, and I want to uh, start off with a bad joke of the day, because that's your favorite part of Wednesday night. And so, I have this one. This is probably too easy, but I want to give this one to you anyway. Why did the man name his dogs Rolex and Timex? Because they were watchdogs. I really expected more people to be, you know, saying that, but I don't know. I, th I thought it was pretty easy, but I don't know. Maybe it was, and you guys are just, uh, you know, helping me out here. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, we started last week a study of Revelation, and we're looking at uh, God's Word for the Biblically Inept, and basically what I call this, this is a book that I have that I'm going through and teaching through this book. Um, it's basically, I call it Revelation for Dummies. Um, it, it, it brings it down to a level to where I can understand it, to where I can be able to teach it in a way that hopefully you can understand it as we go through these things. And so, uh, as we're looking at Revelation, I brought this up last week, but why should we study? Why should we look at Revelation? And so, what I brought up last week was we're living in some perilous times. Um, a lot of things are going on. We, we're constantly uh, barraged with bad news and things that are going on in our world, things that are happening. There is always a, it seems like here lately, there's always a new riot that's going on. Um, right when we think we've got everything about calmed down in one place, another city, something happens and there's riots that go on there. And, and it's just always something that's going on. And then this election has just got everybody just all uh, frizzled out and, and everything that's going on. And so it's just, it's, a, it's some weird times that we're going through. Uh, the sickness that we're going through, you just never can tell what's going to happen and, and where it's going to happen. Um, Abby, my daughter, who, who was sick three months ago with this virus, still cannot smell anything. And so it's just a lot of things that are happening over this time period of all these things that are going on. And so as we look at Revelation, and we're looking at why we should study Revelation, but we have to understand, though, even though sometimes we, we tend to get scared of Revelation, we don't understand it, so we just avoid it, we, we don't ever look at it, it is still the Word of God. It is still part of the Bible that God gave us. And so because it is part of the Bible that God gave us, we should study God's Word. And also because Jesus told us, Jesus told us in the Gospels that we should watch for signs of things to come. Well, how are we going to know what the signs are if we don't read the book of Revelation where he gives us a lot of the signs, a lot of the things to look for? And if we do not study Revelation, our understanding of the entire Bible becomes biblically inept. We're not, it, it kind of ties a lot of things together. We're even going to be, we looked at some of that last week, we're going to be looking at a little bit of that again tonight. 
but we also know that Revelation reveals God's plan for the future. Now, it's not a radar that says tomorrow you're going to have uh, Rice Krispies for breakfast, you're going to stop by McDonald's for lunch, and then you're going to have a flat tire around 4 o'clock. It, it's not that kind of predicting the future. It's just telling us this is what you need to look for because this is how God's plan is for all of us. And so he also, though, and we looked at it last week also, there's a special blessing is promised for all of those who read the book of Revelation. So as we read it and we go through the book of Revelation, there is a special blessing that is given to us. Revelation will also change our lives as we get to reading it and we get to learning about it and we see some of the things that are happening. It can and will change our lives. And Revelation also, the deeper you study it and the more you see that the end times are coming, that they are certain of what is going to happen during those times, it should give you extra, I don't, get, I don't know if that's right, but extra concern for those who reject God and God's Son. You should be able to say, hey, you know what? I really need to get with it because these people need Jesus. We also looked last week and started off with how Revelation has three main divisions, three parts of the book of Revelation. In chapters one through three, it's called the church age. And so we're going through the church age. And so that's where we're at tonight as we continue to look at chapter one. And then in chapters four through 19 is the rapture to the second coming is what's going on during those times. And then 22 through, or 22, 20 through 22 is the millennium and beyond. So we're going to be looking at all of these things as we go through the study and look at the book of Revelation. But as we looked at it last week, we also brought up, one, we brought up some key words. I'm just going to bring up one tonight, and that is the church age. I brought up and talked about this is the church age. This is the time that we're living in. And the church age is a period of time that the church is on earth, us, the church not just our church, First Real Baptist Church, but the churches, any, any church building of people, group of people that believes in Jesus all around the world. This is the church age. And it says it started about 50 days after Jesus was raised from the dead on the Jewish holiday of Pentecost. And then it ends at the rapture. And so when the rapture takes place, uh, this is what's, what's going to be going on with a lot of the so The church age will end. And so I, I put this up here, it, it may be hard to read a little bit, but the rapture and the second coming of Jesus are, sec, are separate events. So we always look at, well, when Jesus comes back, well, Jesus is coming back, but, but before Jesus comes back, the rapture will take place when the Christians will go to heaven. Then according to this chart here and what we're looking at, and this is kind of what I go by as well, is we're in the church age and there's a rapture, and then after the rapture is a tribulation period, and then the second coming. And that's when Jesus comes back, and then after that is when the millennium will begin and, and the thousand-year reign of Christ. And so we're going to be looking through these things. Last week, we made it through the introduction. Last week, we started chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, is what we, as far as we got. And so tonight, we're going to uh, try to finish chapter 1 in verses 10 through 20. So as we look at uh, chap, or, or chapter 1, and we look at verse 10, and we start here, it says this. It says, on the Lord's day I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. So that's what I want to look at just for a second here for a few minutes is verse 10 and what he's talking about here. But I want us as, as a church to understand that it is important, it's important for all of us to be faithful to God's house, to God's church each and every Sunday. Not just, oh, I go once or twice a month. Or, now people say I'm regular attender and they're just coming once a month. That's 12 times a year, but they're a regular attender. It's important for all of us to get, even from this verse in Revelation, as he's talking about, it's important for us to understand that, hey, we need to be faithful to church. Not because you're, you know, I hope somewhat there is a, you have a commitment to this church, to, to, to me as your pastor, to each other as, a, as church members. But I hope you're going to church for God, to learn from God, to learn from what Jesus is trying to teach us. I hope that's why you're here and that's why you're doing this. By the time John was writing this while he was in prison, Christians had already adopted the practice of worshiping on Sunday. Now we say the Lord's Day, Sunday, this is the Lord's Day is when we worship. 
It wasn't always like that in the Old Testament times. It wasn't the Sunday that they was going on, but that has been adopted as the day that we celebrate the Lord's Day today. And it was doing one of those, it was already back in that time during John while he was in prison. And, and part of that was because Jesus rose on Sunday. Pentecost falls on Sunday. And because of these things, you know, we're looking at Sunday is our day of the Lord's Day. This is the day that we worship God. This is the day that we are here. It was Sunday, the Lord's Day, and John was most likely praying. He was in prison. He was on this prison island. He knew it was the Lord's Day. Because it was the Lord's Day, he was praying in his church that he had, which was right there probably in a cave. And so he's celebrating the Lord's Day by praying and talking to God. And as he was praying, it said the Holy Spirit began to take control of him. The Holy Spirit came in and said, hey, takes him off and gives him this vision that he has. And John starts describing and God, John starts to, to, to tell us the things that he was seeing. But one of the things that was going on where he said that the Holy Spirit's voice was the voice that sounded like a trumpet. Now, when I was little, uh, elementary school, I played the cornet for a little while. Cornet is like a small trumpet. And, uh, and those are loud. Those are the loud things. I mean, you can't miss the trumpet area in a band. They're loud. And so he says the, the voice of the Holy Spirit was like a trumpet. It was loud. You couldn't miss it. It was there. All right? So then it goes on to verse 11. He said, and this voice, this loud trumpet voice said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. He says, write these things that you're seeing. Write it down and send it to these churches, these churches that I am listing by name, which is pretty interesting. The voice said, write all, everything down that he saw, everything that you see, everything that's, that's happened right before I said this, what's happening while I'm saying this, and after I say this. Write it all down in a scroll. And this scroll is known as Revelation. And that's what we have, and that's what we're studying, and that's what we're looking at as we go through here. Of the possibly, at that time now, could be thousands of churches that were in the world at that time. Jesus picked seven churches. And he identified them in a very precise order. And we're going to be looking at that as we go through Revelation. He identifies them in a specific order. He names them by name. And it's not just random churches. And it's not just a random order of the list of the churches. He lists them in order that he's wanting them to be listed. And he lists the ones that he wants us to hear about. And so he's going on and he's looking at these. And when you read about these churches, you can begin to see why they were picked and why they were put in this order. We're going to be looking at those churches in chapters 2 and 3 and what the angel said right to them. And so I want you to see this and I want you to see what's going on here. They had, these churches had good and bad qualities. And it turned out that they they became good teaching tools, good teaching models for the modern church today. A lot of the things that they're talking about and some of the things that they're going through can describe the churches that we have been associated with, our church here. We can, we can relate some of these things that he is writing to these churches to our church. Who are we compared to these churches? And who are we compared to what's going on here? The problems that they were going through. Basically, it was a prophecy for future churches. And you'll begin to see this as we go through. It's, 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 I've been excited about it just by looking at what's going on and what's being said through these. And so they're going through this and looking at this. So let's look at verse 12. He says in verse 12, he says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. Okay, that makes sense, right? He hears a loud voice. It sounds like a trumpet. And it says, write to these churches everything that you see. Who's saying this? And he says he turns around. And when he turned around, 
when I turned around, I saw seven golden lampstands. Now, I put up here on this table, I, I moved the flower over there to the organ. Tracy's not here, that's good. All right? And I, there, I put on here, I, this is not what they look like. I don't want you to think I'm trying to give you an exact model of what these lampstands look like. I'm not 100% what they look like, but two, they probably were not wax candles. They were probably more like oil that was in a container with a wick on it or something, and it was burning over here. Like if you have one of those old uh, candle or, or uh, oil light lamps in your house. We have one. I can't call it. Well, I don't even know what it is. I see it. It's there. It's only been used a couple times. All right. But I, I put these here because I want you to see these seven candles, okay? These seven candles that are here. This is kind of, okay, he turns around, he sees, he, and the first thing he sees when he's looking for the voice is seven golden lampstands. So he sees these seven golden lampstands, and these, these were probably, what I said before, were pots that held burning oil in them. So in verse 20, later on, we're going to get to that here in just a little bit, we're going to learn that these seven golden lampstands represented those seven churches that we just named. Okay? So each one of these is one of those churches that, we just taught, that I just brought up in a specific order, a specific church, and that is represented by the candles here, all right? So they're there, that's what's going on with them. But when, but we also will see how these seven churches also represent the seven periods of the church age. The church age that I said that we're talking about, that we are living in now, from Pentecost until we go up to heaven, the rapture is the church age. And these seven churches, these seven candlesticks, represent the seven periods during this church age. Now, again, I don't know if you can see all of this, but as we're looking at this and we look at this church age, the first church that he mentions is Ephesus. And as he mentions Ephesus, Ephesus is the apostolic church. The apostles were, were head of the church. They were leading the church. And that was the thing that they were going through during this first time period. Then there was Smyrna. Smyrna was the second church that was brought up, the persecuted church. And as you read history, you study history, you find out how the church was persecuted. Nero was burning Christians and, and putting Christians out there uh, to be killed and slaughtered. A lot of things that were going on during the persecuted church. And then we see Pergamos. Pergamos was the worldly imperial church, the church that came after that, the church that was going on. And then we get to Thyatira, and it's the pagan pap papal church. What the church started to become again. It started developing even more. And then as we keep going, we get to Sardis. Sardis was the Reformation church. And so we see things that are beginning to change again within the church, this church age, this church period, this time that was going on. And then we get into Philadelphia. Philadelphia was the missionary church when the churches were starting to, the church was starting to send out missionaries and go out and do this. So we see all this stuff through history, through this time period from when Jesus went up to heaven, Pentecost, to now. We can see how all these things are going on, but the seventh one is Laodicea, and Laodicea was the lukewarm ecumenical church. Ecumenical, I had to look that up. Ecumenical is basically churches. All these churches, Christian churches around the world, it's not just one, but Christian churches around the world, lukewarm. <laughs> it's having a conversation even today. Not even about this, but as we were talking about this and we were talking about, uh, you know, some numbers of people that are, uh, you know, I mentioned a while ago that um, on Sundays, we have, since we have started our children's ministry back some, we have seen our numbers go up a little bit. But even though our numbers right now are not the numbers that we had at the beginning of the year, financially, Spiritually, our church seems to be going great. And so you wonder, I'm, I'm stepping on toes and I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to lose my job here. So here we go, you ready? I wonder, 
And you see this, and not just here, but in churches. These lukewarm Christians, these people who are just here because, hey, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And then they got used to not coming to church for a few months because of this pandemic. And, oh, this is easy. I can watch it on TV. And then I watch it on TV becomes, oh, if I have time and remember to do it. And then it just comes this. And then they're just not even there. And they just started fading out because they're lukewarm. And the Bible tells us, he says, hey, and we're going to see this later on in Revelation. He says, because you're lukewarm, you make me want to vomit. I would rather you either be hot on fire for me or cold and totally against me. But because you're just this lukewarm, you make me want to puke. And that's literally what he says. That's what he's talking about. And so we're looking at this, and as we look at this, that's the period that we're in right now. The seventh church, towards the end of this church age. And then this, this was another chart that I found. But as we're going through this, someone, whoever this was that was putting this up here, said, we're right here. This red dot, I don't know if you can see that. This red dot is us in the middle of this Laodicea church, the seventh church of the church age. We're right there. And the next thing to happen is the rapture. And it puts us really close to it. It's coming. It's coming. We look at verse 13. And among the lampstands, the lamps, the lights that are here, among the lampstands was someone like, the son, like a son of man dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. Finally, he hears this voice, his trumpet, he turns around, and the first thing he sees is the lampstands. And then, in the middle of the lampstands, he sees someone standing there. John, he sees where the voice is coming from, and it says, Someone who looked like the Son of Man was standing in the middle of... Now, we said these are lampstands. The Bible says lampstands, but we said the lampstands represent the churches. And this person is standing in the middle of the churches. Man, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of imagery there of what you can see and what's happening and what's going on. He said that this man was wearing a long robe that went down to his feet with golden sash around his chest and official attire of a high priest. And I want you to see, this is... I, again, I can't tell you how accurate 100% this is. This, I, I looked up and tried to find what a high priest would be wearing. And as I looked through a lot of pictures, this is overwhelmingly the, the best picture that I could find to put up here to show you. But he's talking about how he's wearing this robe, and it goes all the way down to his feet, and he has this golden sash over his chest. He's got this wrapped around him. Now, we see, oh, and it's also this, this garment, this, what they're describing here, the clothes that are wearing would be what the high priest is wearing, okay? Not the, I can't think of another word, the peons. The high priest, the high priest is wearing what he's just describing here. And he's standing in the middle of these churches that are down here. Now, why is this significant? Because in Matthew 18, verse 20, it says, For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them, in the midst of them. They're gathering in my name. The church that is gathering, I am with them. Tonight, I believe we are here gathering in the name of Jesus and I believe, according to what I'm reading here, that if we are gathering in his name, <laughs> Jesus is here in the midst of us. That, that should make a difference into how we act and react while we're in church. And what we do, because this is God's house. And we have gathered here for him. And if we're gathered here, he is here with us. This vision means that Jesus will stand in the midst of the church throughout 
the church age. Everything that happened on that, on that screen that I had up there a while ago with all the different churches, everything that was going on, Jesus was still there in the midst of them. Through the persecutions, through the changes that were going on, through the missionary churches that were popping up and starting all over the place, and even in our lukewarm churches today, Jesus is standing in the midst of them. He's still there. He is the great high priest who is always with his church. He doesn't go leave his church. He is always able, and he is always able to intercede for us. That's why we bring our petitions to him. We pray and talk to him because he is our great high priest, and he is in the midst of our church. We get to verse 14. So we see what he sees on the, he sees the lampstands and he sees this high priest standing there and he just starts describing the high priest. He says, the hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow and his eyes were like blazing fire. So we look at that and we see what he's, how he's describing this high priest. When Jesus was crucified, we, hear, we read about how they were hitting him in the face. They were pulling hair out of him. They got a th- crown of thorns and they put it on top of his head. His hair was probably matted with blood from the blood that bled on his hair and dried. It was probably a nasty, nasty looking hair because of everything that was going on to him. So all these things were happening to him. But now it says, as he's describing him, John is describing him, he just says, his hair is like the hair of God as we read back in the book of Daniel. When Daniel was having a vision. In Daniel chapter 7 verse 9, he says, As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. <laughs> His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire and its wheels were all ablaze. (laughs) He's describing the ancient of days, Jesus. Says he has this hair of white and now when John is talking about the vision that he saw, he says, this high priest, his hair was white. Because now Jesus' hair, even though it went through the blood and all the things from crucifixion, Jesus' hair now is shining with the pure white brightness of heaven. Because that's who he is. This is our Savior. But it also says, as he leaves his hair, it says his eyes were burning like a blazing fire as he looked out over the seven churches. His eyes were burning like a blazing fire. Man, this is, a, this is quite a picture that's being painted here by John as we look at these things. But we look back at Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24, it says, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. And so he's talking about him being a consuming fire, a jealous God, and he just said that here in Revelation how his eyes were ablaze like fire. Basically what he's saying is this. Nothing has escaped his penetrating glare. Nothing you can do can hide from what he sees. He sees every good deed. He sees every bad deed. For every generation to come, he sees what's going on. In Psalm 139, verse 7, which I don't have a slide for this, but in Psalm 139, 7, it says, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? He sees it all. He sees everything. His his eyes are like fire because he is a jealous God, and he is not happy when we are not doing what we're supposed to be doing. Nothing escapes him. Verse 15, it says in verse 15, his feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. 
in the book of Micah in the Old Testament. Micah, or God told the Jews in the book of Micah to rise up and to crush their enemies. And here's what he says to them and how he tells them to do it. He says uh, in chapter 4, verse 13, he says, Rise and thresh, daughter of Zion, for I will give you horns of iron and I will give you hooves, feet of bronze. And you will break to pieces many nations. He was telling them to rise up and crush their enemies in Micah. So here what we see here in verse 15 is we see that the feet of Jesus were like burning bronze, a reminder that he's going to be the judge of everyone, of everything that happens. He's going to crush. He's going to be the righteous and the true and the faithful judge for everyone. And that's what he's describing. That's what he's telling us about. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, it tells us, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due for the things they have done while in the body, whether good or bad. We all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ with the bronze feet that is the judge that is judging the good and the bad. But he talks about his voice. He says his voice was like the sound of rushing water. And the sound of rushing water, his voice is like the mighty waves of the ocean. When you go and sit at the ocean and you just hear that coming in, there's a loud sound that's continually coming in. We've been to the ocean. That, that's a deep thing about us living here is that when we talk about the ocean, we don't know what we're talking about. We've been there and seen it. I've lived in many places that nobody's ever even been to the ocean. And we can understand that roar of the ocean just constantly coming in, that sound that's there. It is the voice who spoke everything into existence. Let there be, and there was. Let there be, and there was. He was the voice of the one who raises the dead. Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus gets up, walks out. The voice who controls all of creation he tells the sun when to come up and when to go down. He controls it all, this voice. So what we're learning here in, in, in just in these few verses, 15 verses so far in Revelation, in verse 8, we see that Jesus is our God. In verse 13, Jesus is our high priest. And in verse 15, Jesus is our judge. He is all of these things to us. And we move on to verse 16. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all of its brilliance. Jesus, later on, in verse 20, again, as we get there, tells us, now this is not stars, okay? I tried to find something, and I, in my short time, because I didn't think about this cool stuff until, you know, too late. Um, but I have in my office, these are some... Uh, arrowheads that my grandfather found in the 1920s in southern Illinois. And so I've had these up in my office for years and forever. And, and, uh, and it just so happens when I was looking at them tonight, trying to think, what can I do, what can I do, what can I do? I have seven of them. So in his right hand, I don't want to drop off here, in his right hand, the high priest is standing among the churches, the seven churches down here. And in his right hand, he held the seven stars coming out. He's holding the seven stars. So he's talking about these stars are the seven angels. And these seven angels, their responsibility is to look after the churches. All right? So each one of these has an assignment to each one of these. Watching out. That tells me again, not only is Jesus in our presence, because Jesus is, is uh, omnipresent, he's everywhere. Not only is Jesus in our presence, but Jesus is also assigned an angel to watch over our church. That's what I'm getting from this. All right? We have this. And he says, listen, 
Their, their job is to look after our church, but they are in his right hand, which means they are his own precious personal possession. They are his in his right hand. Right hand is very significant throughout the Bible. Right and left. And they're in his right hand, the angels that are watching over. It's important to him what they do and what's going on with them. We have to understand that. But we also, as we, get, as we continue to look through this, We see in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says this. It says, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. And so I happen to have also, this is a little more accurate than those, those were. All right? I happen to have this. I bought this in Segovia, Spain. And uh, it, it's a real sword, could be sharpened, but it's not very sharp at all. I mean, it's not sharp at all. But I've used this for many children's church illustrations over the years. It's a great thing. Because it's talking about the word of God being a sharp, double-edged sword, and that represents the Bible. Jesus will deal with his church through his word. And his word is like this. The Bible is a very efficient sword. It says it's a sword that stabs. It's got a point on it. It stabs. And it cuts its, its blades on both sides. It's not one of those swords that's just got a blade on one side. Blades on both sides. It cuts both ways. And because it's able to, to penetrate us, able to cut us either direction. We would be wise to heed what the word of God, the Bible, says to us because those are the standards by which we will be judged and it says it is coming out of his mouth and it says that the Bible is the very words of God coming out of his mouth and so boom, you throw all those together. To me, that it just gets really cool how we have that. But he also talks about how the face of Jesus was glowing. Shekinah glory. Shekinah glory. Glory brighter than the noonday sun. This is a glory that is, I mean, you ever stood out in the noonday sun on a hot day and how hot it is and how bright it is and can't even look up there at the sun? That's what we're talking about here. Jesus is known as the Son, S-U-N, of righteousness. And he is also known as the light of the world. So Jesus is known as these things. And when John looked upon Christ's face, he was seeing right there Shekinah glory. The very glory of who God is. Right there in front of him. <laughs> so what happens? What would happen to you? Verse 17. When I saw him, John says, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Think about that for a minute. What would you do if you were standing before Jesus? I had somebody tell me not too long ago, a few months ago. Yeah, I stand before God, Jesus, one day. I'm going to tell them things I didn't like about stuff. I'm thinking, dude, you will not. And that's what I told him. <laughs> I said, thank you. you think you will. But the Bible talks about the people that have saw Jesus fall on their face before him. John falls on his face before Jesus. He's, and we just described it. Can you imagine? Hair glowing white, eyes of fire bronze feet, sword coming out of his mouth, face glowing so bright, and I'm going to stand before him and tell him what for? <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. But I want you to see something else. <clears throat> Jesus didn't leave John on the ground. He says here that when I saw this, I fell at his feet as though I was dead. <laughs> Shabonk. And as I'm down there on the ground, 
It said he placed his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, John. It's okay. It's me. It gives me chills. Man, he didn't leave him there. But he also says, listen, don't be afraid. I am the first and I am the last. Basically, he is saying here, there is none before me and there will be none after me. I am from everlasting to everlasting. John, this is me. This is who I am. Psalm 41, verse 13. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. That's not just a one amener. Verse 18. Jesus is talking and he says, I am the living one. I was dead. And now look. I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death in Hades. Jesus said about himself, I am the living one. Capital L, capital O. I am the living one. This is who I am. I was dead, John, you saw me. You were there at the foot of the cross with my mother. And you saw me die. I was dead. But John, (laughs) I'm alive. I'll be alive forever and ever. You remember, John, you ran to the grave. You raced Peter. You remember that, John? I'm alive. His crucifixion, he says, basically, will not be repeated. There will not be another crucifixion. He has risen from the dead, and he will never die again. We can relate that. We've seen he rose, he, Jesus raised uh, uh, the, the, the guy from the military, who raised his daughter up from the dead, Jairus' daughter. He raised up Lazarus. They went on to die again. They went on to die again later. But Jesus, he rose from the dead. He's still alive. And we have to understand that. We have to know that that is who he is. And not only is he alive, but he said he holds the keys. I hold the keys. I have the keys. The keys. So he is in control. I am in control of my truck and my house. I'm in control of these things because I have the keys to those things. Jesus has the keys of death. And of hell. He's in total control of death and hell. And because of this, John and any other Christian that comes along need not fear death or hell. Because I have Jesus in my heart. Yeah, death is a departure. I'm going to be leaving, but I don't have to fear death. I don't have to fear hell. Because I'll be with Jesus. Because Jesus has the keys. Jesus is in charge. Christians should not be afraid of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is a book of comfort. Should be a book of comfort to the Christian. We're going to be looking at this stuff. We're going to read some stuff. You're going to think, how is that comforting? Well, here's the thing. Because I'm a Christian, it's comforting. If I'm not a Christian, it's definitely not going to be comforting. But because I am a Christian, it is comforting. Jesus has removed the sting of death and hell for those that follow him. Verse 19. Verse 19 says, Write therefore what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. What John was viewing was not just for his own personal knowledge. John, I'm not taking you on your own personal little thing so you can see it and just be for you. I am taking you here because I want you to write these things down because I want all of God's people to be able to know what you know. 
to be able to see what you see. Now, if he said, I saw this high priest standing there, and he didn't give all this description of the sword coming out of his mouth, his eyes on fire, his hair being white, his feet bronze, his face shining, Shekinah glory. If he didn't give all those descriptions, he'd just be another guy standing there. But John is giving us all of these descriptive words of all of these things going on here because he wants you to see what he saw. That's what he wants you to get. He said, what you have seen, this refers to the events that, have, that we have covered already in chapter 1. And as you look at this chapter in four places, verse 9, 10, 12, and 17, those verses are in past tense, those things that happened. Okay? So you write down the things that you have seen. And then, what is now that refers to the events of the present church age that we've talked about, the church age, the things that were going on, chapters 2 and 3 that we're going to be looking at, they describe the seven churches that actually existed. They were real churches during John's time. While John was having this vision, while John was on this Isle of Patmos, these were real churches. So he's saying, what is now? What is going on now? They, these churches were selected for this revelation because they reveal the aspects of the seven periods of the church age that we looked at a while ago. And he said, this is the now. This is where we're at. But then he also said, what will take place later. That refers to the future events that's going to happen after the church age is over, after the rapture of the believers, chapters 4 through 22, the things that are going to come. Things that are going to happen later. Write these down so people will know what you're, what's going on here, what's going on now, and what's going on in the future. Know this stuff. Know what's going on. That's the chart that I put up there a while ago. Know what's happening, John. I want you to write down these things so people will know the stuff that's going on. The, the events of Revelation have to be kept in their proper time periods of when they happen. John's vision in chapter 1 is of the past events, things that will not happen again. It's not going to be repeated. He's saying, this is what's going on. This is what's happening. The events of chapters 2 and 3 are present events. The things that were going on during John's time, they do not have anything to do with the events that's going to happen in the future. So he says, listen, keep these in specific order of what's going on and what is happening. Because right now, the stage is being set for those future events. As we look at what's going on and what's happening in our world, the stage is being set. They will not be fulfilled, though. Those future events, until after the church age is over and the rapture of the believers. That's the things that will come. That's the things that will happen then. And then we get to the last verse, verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So right here in verse 20, to avoid any misunderstanding, God uses the Bible to interpret the Bible. This is what you read. This is what you're reading about. Here's what it means. I'm going to tell you what it is. And he tells us specifically, Jesus clearly identified the seven stars in his right hand as the angels of the seven churches. The angels that are watching out over the churches. The lampstands signify the seven churches. They also foretell the history of the church from Pentecost to rapture, the seven churches. And we're going to get into that in the next couple of weeks as we look at chapters 2 and 3. But I want you to see this as we look at Revelation, as we look through the book of Revelation. A mystery, we talked about Agatha Christie last week. A mystery is a hidden truth that has not been made known before. It's a mystery. I don't know. Until it's revealed. When the mystery is revealed, 
It's meaningless. Well, until it's revealed, it's meaningless to the reader. I don't understand it. It's a mystery to me. I don't know how it happened. Once it has been revealed, the mystery has been revealed, and you see it, and you know what's happening, it ceases to be a mystery, and then it becomes a revelation. So see, as we look at the book of Revelation, it's not meant to be a mystery. It's meant to reveal the mystery for you to be able to know what's happening and know what's going on. And next Wednesday, we'll go to chapter 2. This is our study of the book of Revelation, God's word for the biblically inept and this is what we're looking at and going through. I'm enjoying it, just the stuff that I'm doing. And so uh, I hope that you're enjoying it. I hope you're being challenged by it. Tonight, I mean, just when you start looking at this stuff, uh, to me, I get excited about it. So I hope you are too. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for all that you do for us. God, thank you for loving us. God, thank you for revealing this mysteries to us so that it's not a mystery anymore for telling us what's happening, what's going to happen. But God, more than anything, help for us not just to see what's going on, to see how it's relating to us and where we're standing at, but God, help for it to, to cause us to have a burden for our friends and family members who are not Christian, who are not prepared for these things. God, help for us to go in and be this best witness that we can be for you. God, give us a great week. Be with all those on our prayer list. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to do something different tonight. I'm